On a March morning, Thomas Hamilton armed himself with four guns, walked into a primary school gym and started shooting He had more than 700 bullets and started firing at random killing and injuring children aged 5 and 6 before he turned the gun on himself A total of 16 children and one teacher died at the hands of the evil killer on 13 March 1996 in a horror dubbed the Dunblane Massacre which remains the deadliest mass shooting in British history Complaints had been made about Hamilton in the months leading up to his murderous rampage as he acted strangely around young boys and appeared to be showing a growing sense of resentment for authority and the people around him This had begun when Hamilton learned the truth about his family at the age of 22 a secret that had seen him grow up believing his mother Agnes was his sister because his family were desperate to avoid the shame they perceived in him growing up in a single parent family This feeling developed as he was ostracized at school and later as he tried to seek solace in the scouts where he was later rejected, struggling with accusations that he was strange and was a pedophile Instead, he turned to guns, amassing a huge collection of firearms and becoming a member of a rifle club Peter Aylward, a psychoanalyst appears on CBS show Murderers and Their Mothers which analyses the case He said his relationship with guns took quite a perverse turn. He used to talk to his guns as if they were children. It's as if the guns replaced the children that he had tried to gather around him. In this way, he had complete and utter control of his guns and ammunition in a way that he never could with children. And it was after he had got a collection of guns that Hamilton planned the Dunblay massacre He arrived at the school wearing ear defenders and even cut the wires at the bottom of a telegraph pole outside in a bid to prevent them calling emergency services as he went on the rampage Once inside the school he headed straight for the gym at Dunblane Primary School, where class 1 all aged 5 or 6 were having a PE lesson with teacher Gwen Mayer Peter added, the gym was where he had focused all of his life and in terms of his boys clubs, where he had been ostensibly denied the ability to parent in the way he wanted It is the scene of his life's work. By killing the children, he is attacking the parents. It's an enacted murderousness against those that disowned him. It began with his father, then his mother, and became displaced into his community. Hamilton had four guns with him, which he fired at random, killing 16 of the children. Twelve other pupils were injured in the atrocity with just one from the class of 29 escaping uninjured Gwen, a mother of two, was the 17th person to be shot and is believed to have been trying to shield the children as Hamilton kept firing The devastating massacre took a little over three minutes. Hamilton was born on May 10, 1953 Shortly after his birth his father left Hamilton's mother Agnes for another woman Mother and son moved back in with Agnes's adopted parents, her aunt Catherine and uncle Jim, who had adopted Agnes after her own mother gave birth to her out of wedlock and they had been keen to hide this It was then that her aunt decided to adopt Thomas as well to prevent him having to grow up in a single parent family which they saw as having an incredible stigma 
but Thomas was never told and grew up with his mother as his sister and his incredibly controlling adoptive mum Catherine who was later referred to as the mother from hell Peter added, in Thomas Hamilton's family history we have repeated experiences across the generations of an attempt to avoid the shame of children born out of wedlock Catherine went to great lengths to advertise to the community that she had fallen pregnant again and was having another child in order to conceal this child, Thomas, from the stigma of a father Having left the family to have an affair We know that shame and humiliation is one of the major contributory factors to violence, where violence attempts to eradicate any feelings of shame It doesn't but it is one of the main reasons violence exists and is enacted As Hamilton grew up in a strained home environment, he also struggled to make friends at school and was often referred to as loner He left school at 15 to become an apprentice and he also joined the Venture Scouts By 1973 he was second in command of his local scouts group a place where he thrived due to the organization and rules He also joined the Dunblane Rifle Club, developing his obsession with guns, and over the years, began to amass a collection of weapons At age of 21 became leader of 24th Sterling Scouts a position that gave him a notion of parenthood and the sense of belonging that he desired But some of his trips were fraught with disaster. In 1973, Hamilton set off from Stirling with a party of Boy Scouts heading for Abymore in the Scottish Highlands. By the time they got to the area, it was dark, and their van broke down. About a dozen children ended up spending the night sleeping huddled together in the back of the vehicle in sub zero temperatures. Within weeks another trip would see him thrown out of the scouting movement for good Yet another party of scouts headed off for a winter field trip. Hamilton ended up with 12 youngsters soaked to the skin and on the verge of hypothermia He was asked to leave the scouts because of complaints about his behavior and accusations started to fly around that he was a pervert Peter added, the impact that this would have had was catastrophic. He spent the next 21 years trying to address what he felt was this major issue. In the same year, he learned about the truth of his family and that the woman he thought was his sister, 21 years his senior, was actually his mother. Desperate to get back into the scouts, Hamilton approached District Commissioner David Vass and offered his services as a leader But Vass checked him out and was told, don't touch him by others in the scouts. All of Hamilton's later attempts to rejoin the scouts failed Annoyed that he had been dismissed by the scouts, Hamilton started up a network of boys clubs with the Dunblane Rovers He did activities that were similar to the scouts and used to take children away on trips with him But he was known to be very strict and run his summer camps in a strange way, forcing boys to wear black swimsuits and taking pictures of them He used to display these pictures in his home in Stirling and show people who came to visit Peter added, his relationship with the boys had a sadistic quality Part of his character was taking pleasure in other people's pain, particularly boys' pain Hamilton never managed to escape the rumors circulating about him Rumors of his obsession with young boys were rife People had complained about his bizarre sports training sessions 
where he made young lads play without shirts. The boy with the biggest chest would be promised he could be captain. Complaints about Hamilton's summer camps led to him being probed by child protection officers from three Scottish police forces. But despite extensive inquiries, there was never a prosecution. I in the community, Hamilton was being labeled a pervert, a name that offended him to such an extent he started a campaign of writing letters, sending irate notes to the Queen in her position as patron of the Scouts Association and the local council accusing schools in Dunblane of contaminating the boys against him. Experts point to his twisted family relationship and his expelling from the scouts as contributing to Hamilton's growing resentment of his family and the community around him, and eventually a well-thought-out plan to murder. After learning the truth about his family he had a strained relationship with his adoptive parents and eventually moved to live on his own in a house on the outskirts of Stirling. He visited his mother twice a week, phoning her every evening. But he always treated her like a sister. Dr. Kiri Nixon, a forensic psychologist, said, You would have grown up feeling very betrayed. Who am I? What is my identity? How could you be my sister and not love me? Didn't you want me? No wonder this is a man who would have some deep-seated psychological issues. He wanted people to look up to him and to be in control. It met so many psychological needs for him to be that figure that was in charge of the scouts. I think there's always this brewing anger that is not being released, but it's there. In the 1990s his love for guns came to the fore. In 1995 he renewed firearms license and in September of that year bought a 9mm Browning pistol and a few months later a Smith & Wesson. He is then thought to have started to plan the massacre. Hamilton's mother apparently knew about his gun club and boys clubs but never suspected her son could turn to murder. On the eve of the massacre he visited his mother as normal, had dinner and a bath, and gave no indication of the atrocity he would carry out in the next few hours. Dr. Nixon added he would go out, as he saw it, in a blaze of glory. Everyone would remember him, no one would ignore him again. He would have status, albeit a status none of us would want. Experts believe he had carefully planned the murder even cutting the wires so that calling the emergency services would be delayed. Elizabeth Yardley, associate professor of criminology at Birmingham City University, said, there's no remorse whatsoever. He feels entirely justified. He feels these people have stigmatized him and victimized him and labeled him, and he feels no one should treat him like that because of those seeds sown in his childhood and adolescence have grown into the same toxic tree he had been planning, ruminating and fantasizing about doing something like this for a long time. A program about the Dunblane massacre will be shown on the latest program in the Murderers and Their Mothers series on CBS Reality on Sunday at 9 p.m.